we started out community grains sort of early on with the idea that it needed to be everything. That when we started to look at what a local grain economy was and what it meant, the pieces didn't make sense unless you had them next to each other. And so we yeah. thought it was something that should be more available and that in fact we could expand and make a local grain economy that was a real, a real thing and, and, and available to people. And along with that idea is that it's really a pain in the ass to grow wheat on a small scale. It's very expensive, very, you don't get any kind of economies of, of scale or anything like that. It's, it's really difficult. And so it's important that that go on and those brave uh, small farmers who will farm five and ten acres and experiment with variety and, you know, they become a really important piece of this. But at some point we thought we needed to go beyond that and make it, you know, a fuller environment. And, and an environment that's an alternative to, um, to an industrial structure. The problem with the industrial, there are a lot of problems with the industrial structure, but for us initially, the first thing was that we couldn't get any information. And we couldn't understand it. We couldn't understand anything because there was no way to penetrate that. And so we started this idea of creating an alternative with the in mind of just understanding it. Along the way, we've found some really wonderful uh, cohorts. The afternoon is going to be about nuts and bolts. It's going to be about um, cleaning and storage and milling and baking. You know, you all might be very interested in whole grains, but we will, you probably know and we'll learn later that not everybody is and that the market really isn't there yet. And, and so we think we need to inform the market. We need them to be really smart because it's really complicated. And we need dazzling food. We need food that people are going to go, wow, that is something else. So we have some bakers here and some food makers that are pretty amazing. And so we'll learn about those adventures. This morning is, um, is the why. The, um, the picture is really murky. We all think we want whole grain, but in fact, there's really no definition that's usable, usable for whole grain. And how much do we know about whole grain and which definition makes sense and does it really have uh, health implications and what are they and why would they be there? If you go to the grocery store and you're looking for whole grain, whatever that is, is there anything you can see on the store on any label that says, oh, this is what I want? So these are challenges and, um, and it's sort of the foundation of what we're trying to do and I don't think we can effectively ask people to eat whole grain unless we know more about it. And um, so that's this morning. So this is Michael Pollan. You all know Michael Pollan. Um, he's just a wonderful journalist and a, a really smart and um, someone for me who continually opens up new um, new ideas and new windows. And he's got, I think, some pretty interesting ideas that are coming up. It's going to be really loose. They're each going to talk for a while. There's going to be a lot of conversation. There's some microphones uh, that we're going to hand out in the audience. At some point, Stephen Jones, who's scheduled for the afternoon, is going to take this seat because um, I think he's going to be really helpful in the conversation uh, when we get into the structure of seat. And so Stephen's there and, and uh, so. Michael. Thank you, Bob. It's really nice to be here among so many of my teachers. Um, and, and next to a couple of them right here. Well, I'm really glad I'm going first because I know less uh, than anyone else who will be speaking to you today. So it would really look bad. No, I don't know about that. Um, so uh, it's good you're starting with me. Um, I thought I would tell a little bit about my own journey and what brought me to this community of people who are, are semi-obsessed with... Uh, with whole grains and with bread in general. Uh, my last book, Cooked, uh, was a story of uh, the four, four great transformations that, that we call cooking, one of which is baking. Uh, and as part of that, I underwent a, uh, I embarked on a quest to make a, a great loaf of bread. Um, probably a failed quest, but that was the quest. And I started, like most people do, with uh, white bread um, because that's most bread in our culture, and it's easier to do. And, um, and I got 
okay at it, but I've also written a lot about nutrition, and I knew pretty well that white flour, although it's incredibly attractive to us for many, many reasons, and it, and it, and it fits industry and, and the way mechanization and capitalism work, um, it's not ideal. One of the, the subtexts of this book is that uh, for most of human history, and I'm, talking, I'm going back two million years, uh, most of the things that have, uh, innovations that have happened under the, the, the umbrella of food processing, uh, beginning with putting fire to food, continuing with um, uh, cooking in pots with liquids, um, uh, firm, all the various fermented foods, all these incredible inventions of our species have contributed to our health, uh, have tended to make food more nutritious, have tended to make it more interesting and more flavorful, and have tended, uh, you know, also often to increase its shelf life. And these have been very positive. So food processing, a word that we kind of put negative connotations on for most of history, has been a very good thing for us. And it counts for a lot of our success as a species, uh, because a lot of, most animals don't cook and don't know how to process their food to, to make it more nutritious the way we do. There's a couple exceptions, like squirrels who bury seeds to ferment them a little bit. So I was really curious as to, to determine the, the, the turning point when food processing went bad. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized it was the invention of the roller mill in the 1870s and 1880s. The roller mill is what gave us really white flour. Before that, you could get whitish flour. It tended to be a little yellowish um, because basically you were grinding it on a stone mill and then you were sifting it as, as finely as you could and you got rid of lots of the bran, but you couldn't quite get rid of that smushed germ, um, and which turned out was keeping people healthy uh, to a very large extent. But we wanted flour to be whiter. There were a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one is prestige. Uh, white flour, like white rice, had always had this kind of prestige. It showed you had money because it took money to, to, uh, to sift it. And also because we are hardwired to like sugar, sweetness. And the whiter the flour, the quicker the hit of sugar you get when it, beginning the moment it hits your tongue. Um, so it's no wonder that uh, it, was a, it was a goal and it was achieved with these, uh, these mills that uh, for the first time made it possible to break off the bran and the germ uh, immediately and leave that starchy white endosperm as basically all you were going to eat, which is mostly starch and it has some protein as well. As soon as this innovation hits, many interesting things happen. One is you have the consolidation of uh, the milling industry because now that uh, now that you're down to the white starch, you don't have the germ that's going to cause rancidity. So suddenly flour can last indefinitely, which means you don't need a little mill in every town. And, and one, you know, a handful of large companies can mill all your flour, which is what we now have. And so you have the consolidation of milling. And you also have uh, suddenly uh, a whole lot of health problems. Um, you have to remember how central bread was to most of European history. It represented about 50% of the calories uh, in, the, in the diet in Europe for hundreds of years. So if you fundamentally changed its nutritional quality, which we did, no wonder that we had um, uh, you know, rising rates of, um, of chronic diseases, uh, we had nu uh, nutrient deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies, and people were getting sick on this, uh, on this new bread. Um, eventually, uh, we figured out part of the problem, which was that we had taken out um, important nutrients. And so beginning early in the last century, we started fortifying bread. And this was kind of the classic capitalist fix. You know, once you've screwed up a food, you don't go back and retrace your steps and try to get it right. You create a new business that makes money off of the problems created by the last business. Um, and so we created Wonder Bread, which is really the, the, the symbol of this. This was done with, uh, with government uh, participation. And uh, they fortified the bread. And then they made it a selling point. Builds healthy bodies. It was first eight ways. Now I think it's 12 ways. Um, <laughs> and maybe it's gone higher since then. So basically, it, it's brilliant business. It allows you to sell the problem and the solution in one neat package. Um, but it doesn't, it's only as good a fix as our understanding of nutrition is. And, and this is where the work of, um, 
the, the man to my left was really central to my understanding. Um, David has done work on um, uh, food synergy. And, and one of uh, his, his, I think, amazing findings, and he'll tell you more about it, is that, first of all, we, under, we know that people who eat lots of whole grain generally are healthier and have less chronic diseases and better mortality, uh, um, a better lifespan than other people. We know it has something to do with the nutrients that we took out of whole grain. Um, but here's the amazing thing. Even people who get all those nutrients from other sources, I'm talking about the vitamins and the fiber and you know, the oils that are in whole grain, don't do as well as people who just eat whole grain. It strongly suggests that breaking foods down into their parts and reassembling them doesn't necessarily work. And there could be two possible explanations for that. One is we haven't identified all the stuff we've taken out of it. We can only put back what we can measure and, and, uh, and return. And the other is, as he suggests, that there is some synergy between those nutrients and the structure of the food, which we never talk about. We just talk about these, these building blocks. The more I learned about the importance of whole grain, and, and there was another context in which I was learning about it, which I was learning a lot about the gut which Bob alluded to and Mark can talk to us about uh, in greater detail, but we are learning that um, our health is uh, not just uh, connected to the foods that we eat in the sense of our bodies, but we share our bodies with uh, you know, a vast number of other species uh, of microbes, mostly bacteria, and that unless they're well-fed as well, we're not going to be healthy. And so all our nutrition science has been built on really feeding our bodies, which really represents only about 10% of the story um, by species, and 1% by numbers of cells. And so that uh, unless you take account of the interests of the microbiome, uh, and these are mostly the microbes occupying your large intestine, you are not going to be uh, completely healthy. And this, this, this brings up the importance of fiber, something that you take out of whole grain. Uh, to make white bread. And, and we never, we knew fiber was important and we had epidemiology suggesting fiber was important and people thought it had to do with things like bulk and transit time through the digestive system. But lo and behold, the real importance of fiber turns out to be, according to our current knowledge, that it's the favorite food of the uh, microbes in your gut and that they need fiber um, to, as a food source. And without it, they don't do very well and then we don't do very well. So the complexity of whole grain is such that it's very interesting to do the reductive science and try to get to the bottom of it, but the important thing to keep your eye on is we know it's important. And uh, so I went looking for my second quest, which was to build a, a great whole grain loaf, much, much harder. So the question is, why was it so much harder? Why not just substitute white flour for whole grain flour? There's whole grain flour everywhere. You can buy it, you know, General Mills will sell it to you. Um, but if you simply substitute it in a recipe, it doesn't work for a lot of very interesting reasons. I mean, we've all had these loaves, these you know, brick-like hippie loaves that were you know, very common in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. And by and large, they, they, those loaves sucked because they were substituting you know, not very good whole grain flour for white flour. And a couple things happen. One is, um, and we'll learn this from Stephen Jones a little later, um, we have not been breeding wheat for the purposes of making whole grain flour. We've been breeding it to make white flour, to have the biggest, starchiest endosperm and highest protein level in the endosperm possible. And so when you're selecting, you can't select for everything at once. And so if you select for that, you kind of ignore the quality of the bran and the germ and the flavor of those things. So over time, bran got harder, because that made it easier to mill when you're making <coughs> white flour, and bran got more bitter. So it didn't taste as good as it once did, uh, and as it still could if you kept that in view. And there are breeders here working on that, that very question. Um, then there's the issue of commercial yeast. Commercial yeast is adapted to a white flour system. And so you really, if you don't have a sourdough starter and you just kind of use your same recipe, <laughs> and use yeast on whole grain flour, you're going to have the phenomenon that you've all noticed with those uh, hippie loaves, which is it crumbles in your toaster. It doesn't have any kind of 
integrity as a loaf of bread because the wheat hasn't been properly conditioned by a sourdough starter. So there's another change you have to take account of. The recipes themselves, too, whole grain is, is, is much more temperamental. It's much more active. It has a lot more food for the microbes. So sometimes your fermentation speeds up and goes crazy. So there are many, many uh, you know, things that have to change. And I realize that we're making whole grain bread in what I call a white flour industrial complex, and that that is impossible to do well that you need different kinds of wheat, you need different kinds of baking, you need, you need a different uh, microbial culture, and you need a different human culture to make it really well. And so I went looking for that. And, and I had a moment of despair along the way, when I, and I was turning out one lousy loaf after another, and I realized, you know, I don't just need new flour, I need a whole new civilization to do this right, <laughs> which is setting the bar kind of high. And that's what brought me to Bob actually, was that Bob was one of a handful of people around the country working with um, uh, many of the people you're going to hear from today who is creating that new civilization. Bakers learning a culture or relearning re a culture of making great whole grain. Breeders um, uh, finding, you know, the idea of, uh, focusing on the idea of breeding for flavor of whole grain. Millers uh, like Joe Vanderlee, who we'll hear from later, who have uh, really innovated the, the milling of whole grain. Every step has to be uh, conceived in a, in a different way. And it's a tremendous project, and it's only just beginning. But what's exciting about what you're going to hear today is you're going to meet many of the pioneers of that process who are creating, in place of the white flour uh, industrial complex, a whole grain community complex. because. It, it can probably never be industrialized, what we're talking about. It's going to be much more a function of communities. It's going to need, because you're going to need flour that's local and fresh, and, uh, and making bread is going to be different in the Bay Area than in New York or in uh, the Northwest. So anyway, that's why I'm excited to be here, is that what brought me to Bob's door, Community Grains, Joe's, uh, Stephen Jones, um, the scientists on this panel and others, is that these are people really working to create this, this new economy that's going to let us make whole grain bread um, into a fantastic tasting uh, and incredibly helpful to our population food. Uh, so I look forward to listening uh, with you to, uh, to the wisdom about to be imparted. Thank you. Well, I have to say, wow. <laughs> 